Hello, good morning, um, welcome to today's meeting um, of the transport portfolio, I don't know, or any transport meeting of the Portsmouth City Council. Uh, I'm Gerald Van Jackson, I'm one of the councillors and I'm Cabinet Member for Transport. Um, <clears throat> just quickly to go through for people in the building, um, there's no fire alarms expected, so if it goes, it's real, and we go and meet, I think, with Queen Victoria. Yeah, that's right. And sign out if you signed in. Um, we've got apologies for from Brian Madgwick, who's the PIP representative, who's on annual leave. Um, and we have a couple of deputations, but let's quickly go around the room so everybody knows who everybody is. Shall we start on the front, Graham? I'm Councillor Graham Heaney. I'm the Labour Group spokesperson for transport. Claire? Hi, I'm Claire Seek, a member of the public. And coming to talk to us about car okay. Simon? I'm Councillor Simon Bosher. I'm the Conservative spokesman for transport. Uh, Bethan Mose, transport delivery manager. Felicity Tipperary, assistant director for transport. Simon Bale, Principal Public Transport Officer. Hayley Chivers, Transport Planning Manager. Kirsty Routledge, Principal Transport Planner. Uh, Mark Woodall from Atkins, supporting on the car club. Tim Reynolds, Finance. I'm Darren Sanders, I'm on the Liberal Democrat Councils for Baffins and North Milton. I'm here to make a deputation about bus services. I think we refer to it as Occupied Milton. Milton. Um, Alison Harper, Democratic Services. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Um, so we've had apologies. Um, any other apologies anybody knows about? Okay, any declarations of interest, colleagues? Nope. Okay. Car clubs. Um, do you want to do the introduction first, and then we'll come to, to Claire? Yep. Leap in. Thank you. So this decision paper provides an update on the traffic regulation order consultation for the introduction of designated car club bays within four wards in Portsmouth, Central South Sea, East Neon Craneswater, St Jude and St Thomas. It is recommended that the Cabinet Member for Transportation provides formal consent for the installation of the designated car club parking bays detailed in Appendix A of the report, which are in the locations of Talbot Road, Devonshire Square, Festing Road, Craneswater Park, Clarence Road, Victoria Road South, Kings Road and Cottage Grove, with the following four um, exceptions for which the decision for inclusion in the scheme is to be deferred, and these are in Francis Avenue, Kimberley Road, Kent Road and High Street. It's also recommended that the Cabinet Member notes that a scheme update report will be brought back six months um, after operation. So the introduction of a car club in Portsmouth contributes to the vision and strategic objectives of the Portsmouth Transport Strategy, particularly deliver cleaner air, as it will support the choice of reduced private car ownership, particularly for households with multiple vehicles, through working alongside other complementary work programmes to promote alternative mode choice and providing access to a private vehicle for essential trips. The first phase of the car club will particularly focus on residential areas where demand for parking is high. And car club vehicles will also be introduced at Lakeside in the north of the city in the first phase of the scheme. So following a full procurement exercise, um, Enterprise Car Club have been appointed as the operator for the Portsmouth Car Club. And within the scheme, car club vehicles will have designated parking bays, enabling guaranteed parking space in which to return the vehicle at the end of the journey. Twelve potential car club locations were identified within the four selected wards and were selected as they are in accessible and visible positions within proximity to other car club spaces and are largely located at or close to the end of each road, minimising disruption. A statutory 21-day traffic regulation order consultation on the proposed bay locations began on the 11th of April and ended on the 2nd of May. Uh, the two uh, bays planned at Lakeside do not require a TRO as they will be placed in the Lakeside car park. Nine responses were received to the TRO. Eight of these were to register an objection, with one requesting further information on a proposed car club bay. Additionally, one inquiry was received prior to the start of the scheme consultation, uh, inquiring about the proposed car club bay in Kimberley Road and raising concerns regarding the loss of a parking space in this road. Consideration has been given to all responses and the final locations proposed have taken into account the consultation feedback, geographical spread of parking bays and ease of accessibility of uh, car club vehicles to residents. 
Of the 12 on-street parking bay locations, included in the TRO location, uh, sorry, consultation, it is proposed that only eight be taken forward in phase one, uh, with two bays present in each of the four wards. This is to ensure a manageable size of the scheme in the initial stages to carefully um, enable monitoring, minimising impact of the local community in terms of reallocating parking spaces. So the four locations that are not proposed to proceed in this phase of the scheme were selected due to other bay locations having better geographical spread within the wards and being in closer proximity to other car club bays. Additionally, the proposed bay in Kent Road is not being taken forward due to a larger number of objections being raised with regards to that location, and the scheme is due to launch in August. Thanks very much. Claire, you've run a car club in South Sea, so you're somebody who knows how it runs. Come and talk to us. Thanks for having me, everybody. Um, yes, my name is Claire Seek, and I live near Wimbledon Park in Southsea. And um, back in 2020, um, some of us as neighbours met to say, how could we improve the state of our roads? Uh, mainly, I'd say one of my priorities was around um, our children getting to school more safely and the challenge of parking in the area. And we met with the council and talked about getting a car club and... Um, we, looked, we explored ourselves about running one as a community, but in the end we decided to approach Enterprise Car Club because the benefits were massive. I didn't have to run it for a start, and it meant that as members we got access to clubs across the country. So we set it up in 2020. We did try to get one on the road because we felt it would be more prominent, so people would be able to see it more. That wasn't forthcoming, so we approached the Sports Centre and BH Live, I don't know if it was BH Live at the time, whoever was there anyway, he said, yes, feel free. They did a little partnership deal with Enterprise, and we've had two cars there since September 2020. Um, obviously, COVID happened, so uh, people's movements changed slightly, but... Um, the cars have been used, when well, nowadays they use about 55% of the time, which is very positive for a car club. And we've got people in our neighbourhood who, some, who actually don't have a car at all anymore. Um, the majority of them are retired and they, their car usage changed. They didn't need to use it for work um, and they've just been able to access it. And people very much view it as being sort of part of a portfolio of options of transport. This is, if, I've got this into my kids' head nowadays. Like, if we need to carry something heavy from B&Q, we borrow the van to do that. Or if we need to get to the hospital quickly, we might use a taxi, we might use a bus. Uh, if we want to get to the countryside, we might use the car club because we can't get a bus, public transport there, that kind of thing. Um, but it's the same we found with some of the retired individuals. So some of them have actually given up cars altogether, which is amazing. Um, other people have just not had as many cars. So we've got a couple of people I was chatting to this week who... Um, one decided not to get a second car and the other one actually gave up their second car and Covid in a sense helped with that because people suddenly realised they had multiple cars sitting outside that they weren't using at all obviously. Um, work patterns have changed so my husband works now officially from home but he is an engineer, he has to go out on site he can now just get the train to Leeds and then use the car club there, which is brilliant. When we had to go, sadly, to my father-in-law's funeral in Inverness, we got the train to Inverness, we could get access to the car um, through the enterprise network, which has been brilliant. Um, we also find that more people are working from home and small businesses, so these car clubs are often... So having them at Lakeside is a great idea. The NHS have some in Fratton. Um, I used to work for IBM, and we had sort of pool cars. I know the council, you know explore these kind of ideas over the years um, but there's lots of small businesses in our city and we've got lots of people in our neighborhood that work from home or are small business owners and it gives people the flexibility of being able to get to meetings and places that they can't get to in other ways and also enables their employees not to have to drive there and then park their car and then get somewhere so um, there are some brilliant benefits from that perspective um, we've also used the one the benefit of being with Enterprise is you can get on the hover and you can jump in a car on the other side if you can't get public transport or cycle up hills, which is <laughs> a killer when you cycle around Portsmouth all the time. Um, so it would be great. I would like to argue that there's actually one on this side as well because people then can get off the, the hover and kind of go that way around. Um, so we have seen people reduce their car use, which obviously was part of our objective um, with the car club. And the fact that Enterprise... Uh, gave us vouchers so people could sort of try it for free, I think is a really helpful way for people to do stuff. Um, so really, I'd just like to endorse and like it to expand even quicker <laughs> and further because we just need as many options so that we don't all have to own our cars and 
have the cost of lots of our cars just sitting there doing nothing, uh, which in the cost of living crisis is important for everyone. That's me. Okay, thanks. Claire, thanks so much indeed. Um, colleagues, it seems to me if this works, this is a by providing a range of different options for people to be able to get around without using their their own private cars, it just helps move people gradually to the place where some people will give up their cars. Maybe they give up their second car or their third car, but they, they reduce the number of cars on the streets. And it seems to be that the experience from other places says that even though we take one car parking space in an area, the number of cars in the overall area will probably fall because people will gradually give up their give up cars and, and actually it will make the parking situation easier, not worse. Um, and, but we need to offer people a range of different alternatives. Um, colleagues, Graham, Simon, who would, would you like, Graham, would you like to come in? Yeah, I, just have, I do have one question um, on the recommendation to, to, it talks about deferring a decision on the parking bays in the <clears throat> four roads named. Is that because we're going to go back and look at those roads again, or are we proposing to look at other roads? And if so, will that require another formal decision meeting to approve the bays if we were to either go back to those roads or choose new locations? I think we would need another meeting. Um, I think we we'd need to look around because I think we'd need to try to think about how we could widen this across more of the city. Um, I also think it's worth going and, and thinking of other locations as well. So I think we'll, let, we'll start with these eight and, and see, where we, see how that works. It may be that there's a great clamouring for the, the ones that we've deferred to come back in, but I, I doubt it. And, but I, I would like to see us offer this service to people across the whole of the city, not just in the south. Is that okay, Graham? I'm, I'm very supportive of this. I think this is a good idea, and I think it's a good option to have. And obviously, because Claire has already run a scheme, we've got a real practical example in the city, yeah. and I just think it's, it's, as you say, another option. And although there's been a bit of sort of concerned about losing parking spaces, I mean, I think in the overall scheme of things, that's not the most problematic aspect of it and I, I don't think that's a reason for not going ahead um, so yeah so I think it, it'll actually make parking easier over time but this is the potential yes yeah. obviously because if as the experience of Claire shows that if people are giving up cars not having second cars mm. um, that will that will ease the, ease yeah. the issue yeah. yeah thank you Simon um, yeah thanks Gerald I've, I've got a, a couple of questions but one if I can to Claire in the first instance the two cars that you've got, they're parked off-road at Wimbledon Park Sports Centre at the moment. Yeah, I thought that's what I understood. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is more about the vehicles themselves. I gather they're petrol, so internal combustion engine vehicles, not electric vehicles. Um, and perhaps one of the questions, I don't know whether it can be answered, but Claire might be able to answer it. I, I, I gather that you pay about £60 per annum to be a member of the club, and it's something like £6.70 per hour to actually hire the vehicle. Where does the fuel cost get factored into that? Because somebody has to refill the vehicle, surely. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so the, um, with, well, answering your second question first, the, you'll pay a nominal fee per mile driven as well. I think it's normally about 15 pence in addition to the £6.70. Is that correct for the enterprise scheme? You're running, Claire? Yeah, that's normally how, the, how they tend to operate. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's how the, um, uh, the, the cost for the fuel are recouped. What normally happens is there's a fuel card in the vehicle. So as a, as a member, um, you'll be responsible for making sure there's a minimum amount of fuel in the vehicle to make sure the next um, person hiring doesn't have to go and fill up straight away. Um, but the, 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 the actual fuel cost is incurred by the operator and then you'll you'll pay a, a small uplift based on the distance you've you've driven in terms of your first question uh, yes so of the of the first eight um eight on-street vehicles we're looking at, at petrol and the, the the two vehicles going to lakeside will be battery electric vehicles and that's um driven largely at the moment by the uh, charging infrastructure so um the 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 the, the, the plan and the part of the agreement with enterprise is to look to move to battery electric vehicles for the whole fleet during the lifetime of this first phase of the car club um, and so we'll be looking to support by providing electric uh, vehicle charging infrastructure 
um, at, 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 at the bays so that the um, fleets will become electric over, over time. Simon says okay. Yeah, okay. Well, no, we'll leap in. Um, I'm, ge I'm generally supportive of it, and I'm pleased that the recommendations have been <coughs> slightly amended to bring a report back after six months. Um, <coughs> I think we need to provide alternative modes of transport availability to it, but I I'm, I'm sort of a bit dubious <coughs> in, in so much that we seem to be hanging this around reduction in, in emissions when we're actually replacing vehicles with similar sorts of petrol-driven vehicles, albeit I hear what you say about the electric vehicles. And I want, I want to try and understand how successful this is, this is actually being. And I hear what Claire says in terms of the anecdotal evidence and, and the non-use, but people are working from home, reducing their vehicle usage probably in what people are calling the cost of living crisis, they're probably getting rid of second and third vehicles because they're unaffordable uh, in that respect. So I don't know how we're actually going to measure this going forward, probably in, in the usage of the vehicles, I suspect, uh, as much as anything else. But I'm, I'm prepared, and obviously it's Gerald's decision, to give this a chance and see how it goes and see what, what comes back in in, in six months' time, but I think we're sort of probably hanging it on the wrong pegs as far as this report is, is concerned. Because certainly, my experience is um, people tend to use a lot of taxis uh, around the city. It could be more; co it's probably more cost-effective. You, you get yourself to your supermarket because we're talking about vehicles for usage when it comes to either in accessible places potentially or alternatively because you're carrying goods that you can't easily carry on public transport. The sort of taxis provide that sort of viable alternative, I think, in that respect. And I came back to something I raised at the briefing meeting, in fact, these are going to be dotted around residential streets, clearly where there's pressures on parking, and you've seen that reflected in the report where we're removing some to start with. Um, but Arguably, if I'm perhaps looking at it from the individual, what's probably the easier alternative? You know, paying out money and being a member of a car club where the car might be several roads away from where you live, as opposed to using an Uber app or, or an Aquacars app uh, to, to, to do exactly the same sort of thing. As I said from the outset, I th I'm prepared to give this a chance and see how it, how it goes, but it's, it's not my decision, it's Gerald's. But I'd certainly be looking in six months' time to see some sort of measurable metrics as to whether this is proven to be a success or whether we are essentially putting more vehicles into parking spaces in residential parking zones and not being used by anybody because all that is going to do is irritate the residents if they're looking at a car with Enterprise written down the side of it that sits there for, for weeks, weeks at a time. I certainly get it from a, perhaps a different angle, I'm, I, I, and I would suggest that probably other councillors are probably getting it, where if a vehicle's parked in a residential street and it hasn't been moved for several weeks, then I'm getting messages in firing it's an abandoned vehicle because people are getting irritated. And that's in Drayton and Farlington, where there isn't necessarily a pressure of parking. So I can imagine it might well be a bit of an irritation in others. But as I said at the outset, I, I, I have some questions around it, and I'm glad that we're bringing this back in six months' time because I will certainly be looking more at that report than this report to see how it is performing and I'm looking for some significant measurable metrics because hanging it around um, clean air, I think, is probably the wrong direction to actually go. Okay. Anybody else want to come in? To pick up on a couple yeah, of those? Do, do leave points in. Several. So just on the six-month report, yes, so we'll, um, we'll be receiving utilisation data um, and revenue data from Enterprise in terms of the operation of the, the car club. Um, and it's important to, to recognise that actually if, um, if we're looking at kind of growth of the car club, because this is a concessionaire contract that will be commercially led, and Enterprise are only going to look at introducing further vehicles if they're making a commercial return. On average, the average car club... Um, vehicle needs about 40% utilisation for the operator to be, to be making a return. Um, and if you compare 
you know, the average vehicle, the average privately owned vehicle is utilised about 4% of the time. So we would expect these cars to be being used at least 10 times more than the average car parked on, on the street. And, and, and that, you know, if enterprises are, are clamming on our door saying, right, we need further vehicles, the demand is high, that, that in itself will be a good indicator, I think, of the, the success of the scheme. Um, just on that data point as well, um, so we'll be getting direct data in from, from enterprise in terms of the usage of the, uh, the car club in Portsmouth, but there is an organisation called Como, um, and they run an annual survey, and they have done for about the last 15 years. Um, they're a charity that, that has a, um, you know, as, as part of their philosophy is to try and promote um, what they call combined or collective transport. Um, and their data, um, certainly sort of post-pandemic, um, is showing continued growth in the car club market in the UK, um, both in terms of membership usage and the number of schemes. So that would suggest that, that um, nationally, and we'll wait to see what happens in Portsmouth, the uh, um, uh, car clubs are still sort of competing and, and seen as a viable alternative to things like Uber and, and taxis. Just one, quick, one question on that and, and the data. And I appreciate there's always going to be a GDPR issue in there, but it will be interesting to know repeat users of the vehicles and if it is possible geographically where they are in relation to where the cars have their dedicated parking spaces as well. You're, you're right in that we can't um, interrogate down to kind of individual level, but we will get anonymised, generalised reports. And, and, and what we will ask Enterprise for is information about where the users of each vehicle are, are located. Um, and, and that data is obviously very valuable for them because they'll be looking at that as to where they want to recommend locating further, further vehicles. Um, you know, if they're finding that people are walking quite a distance to use an individual vehicle, then we probably need to look at locating one a bit closer to where that, that potential catchment is. I think with the four wards that we are introducing the cars in initially, because of the density and the demographics of those, um, those wards, you're, you're, you, I would expect that the, that the cars are going to be very well utilised and we could probably look at additional spaces probably in quite short order, um, and they would still hit that, that utilisation point. Um, if you look at schemes um, in places like Bristol, Leeds, slightly bigger cities, but similar kind of um, um, densities, uh, they've seen quite substantial growth over kind of the first three, four years of the, of the scheme. And I personally don't see anything particularly different here to, to, to suggest that's not going to happen. Okay. Um I think my understanding of the data is that the number of privately owned vehicles in the city keeps rising. Um, so people aren't giving their cars up at the moment. So we need to find ways of offering them an alternative so they, they can. So at least we might bring the, re remove the growth in cars on our roads um, as a first aim. Uh, and let's see how this goes. So my view is that we should give this a trial and see how we get on. Um, yeah, I think it's sensible to come back and look to see what's happened after six months. Inevitably, the first six months will probably be fairly slow growth, just because well, people get to know about it. Um, and so we won't see the full effect after six months, but it's sensible to look. Um, um, <clears throat> but on that basis, I'm happy to go with the recommendations as printed in the paper and hope this means that we've got a, an additional choice for local residents to be able to make um, so that people can look at an alternative of, of owning one or more cars in the city. So I'm happy with that. Um, should we move on? Okay. Moving on to Claire, and thank you very much for coming and, and thanks for setting it up. Um, we're not going to drive you out of business, are we? Well, if we've got the car club run by the city council, I suppose it's all the same, isn't it? It's just, it's just with spaces. Well, yeah, but you are the, you are the creator of it. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. Okay, so next one, clean air zones. Um, who is coming to... Ah, yes, Beth, Beth and hello. And, and this is a report that <laughs> has not a lot to tell us. Uh, that would be correct. 
Uh, yes. So this, this report is for information only, so there is no decision required. And the purpose is to bring to you an update on the first year operational figures for the Portsmouth Clean Air Zone, which went operational on the 29th of November 21, to, and this reports to 29th of November 22. So the report doesn't include air quality outcomes because the government report on the first year for air pollution won't be available until autumn. Uh, just to give some background, we launched the CAS on the 29th of November 21. It's a Class B charging CAS, which charges older, more polluting heavy goods vehicles, buses, coaches, taxis and private hire vehicles for entry into a defined area in Portsmouth City Centre. The CAS will be in place until compliance with legal limits have been met and have proved to be permanent. We will need to have been compliant within legal limits for at least two years, and we need to provide demonstrable evidence in the success of the measures before we will be able to um, remove the clean air zone. So Appendix A to this report provides a summary of the operational figures um, for, for the first year. And the headlines from that are that we've seen um, the vehicles entering the CAS have been 94% compliant. Uh, we do not generate a net income from the CAS, um, and we have no air quality information yet. That's it, thank you. But we look forward to getting air quality information mm -hmm. when the government chooses to give it to us. Yes, yes. So we are in regular contact um, with the Joint Air Quality Unit. Um, we are expecting uh, the first year's air quality outcomes in September. Great. Thanks, Bethan. Simon, Graham, any thoughts, views, anything? Well, I think I, I sort of share your view. I mean, the report's information is, is, use, is, is user information rather than quality information in terms of what it's actually achieving. So we'll obviously have to wait for that. Um, so it's useful up to a point, but not much more than that. Um, I was interested, actually, I noticed that you made a comment in the news um, about this. I know you've been very sceptical about this in the first place. You said that uh, we never thought it was a particularly good scheme, and had the money been given to us directly, we could have used it much more effectively. I just wondered if you had any, uh, if you could say a little bit about what you thought the money could have been better used, because obviously it is time limited, it's not permanent. Um, and obviously, uh, what, 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 what do you think we could have used it for? I think we could have used it for significantly reducing the price of, of buses, so that mm -hmm. more people chose to leave their cars at home and went by bus. And I'm glad the government have moved some way towards that with a £2 fare, but the £2 fare works better in rural areas than it does in urban areas. Um, I think we could have had a scrappage scheme within the clean air zone to get rid of the worst offending, um, oldest and most polluting vehicles that came in and out of, out of the area the whole time. I think we could have done more to support taxi drivers, particularly those uh, with wheelchair accessible vehicles. Uh, and I think we could have done more in terms of um, getting some families um, uh, to be using bikes um, where they can't afford to buy bikes at the moment. So I think there are... It, it's, it's much less flash than the government like in terms of one size fits all and we'll just impose it on you. Um, but I think lots of smaller local things, particularly reducing bus fares, would have made a significant and much better use of the money. I, mean, I think things like a car scrapage scheme would have had some impact and also um, helping taxi drivers would be good. But I think things about the buses is that once you start reducing fares, you then have to keep them reduced. Otherwise, and of course, the money wouldn't have lasted forever. So um, the problem with these schemes is it's about whether it's revenue based or, or one off funding. And uh, I think the the problem we have is that if it's one-off funding, we have to be really careful about what we decide to do because we then have to make sure that if we're doing something that has revenue implications, we plan for that in the future. And that, I think, is also something we're going to have to think about when it comes to the bus improvement plan as well. Okay, I think we will wait and see what the government gives us um, <coughs> in terms of air quality stuff uh, when they choose to send us some data, but thanks, Bethan, for that. Um, I think it's just for information, but thank you very much indeed. Okay, um, next one we have to, for the sake of this appendix, see a colleague's happy to be in formal exempt session, but let's keep the meeting open and just not refer to the details within this appendix. Simon and, and Graham, are you happy with that? 
I think it's highly unlikely. <laughs> I mean, just to clarify, I mean, we have in the past had exam appendices, which we haven't referred to. We've allowed the meeting to continue yeah. to be open, and that's what, if that's what you're suggesting, yeah, yes, that's, absolutely. that's fine, because I have no intention of referring to it, so yeah. we don't need to go into exam sessions, so that's fine, yeah. So, so, but in terms of the formality, we have to, for that appendix, move that we'll be in exam yes. session, which I will therefore do, and let's now then move on to the bus. Simon, I think. Hello. Hello, yes. So, uh, the, uh, the purpose of this paper is to seek approval for the award of contracts for supported bus services. And the recommendations are that we approve the award of contracts uh, for funding for services 12, 13, 14, 18, 22 and 25 from the 3rd of September 2023 until the 5th of September 2026, as detailed in... Uh, the appendix later on, which is confidence, uh, agrees, and it also agrees to the award of the contracts and delegates authority to the Assistant Director of Transport in cons consultation with the Cabinet Member for Transport and Section 15 officer, 151 officer to finalise the required contracts. Notes the Cabinet Member uh, of Transport in opposition spokes will be consulted on any proposed future changes to the supported bus services. And I don't think I really need to say any more at this stage. Well, Simon, I do think I do want to interrogate this a bit more because these are some; these are five pretty big routes in the city for bus use. So the 12 goes from Tipner down to Fratton. The 13 and 14 connects Baffins, Milton, and the Fratton city centre. The 18 um, from Paulsgrove down to South Sea through North End and Fratton. The 22 in Drayton, Follington, and Cosham. Uh, and the 25 going from the hard over to Hailing Ferry. And these are fairly, these are important bus routes. My concern is that these are not operating, or the, the, the operators say that they can't make a profit on this, and therefore they're coming to the council to say, give us a subsidy or we'll shut this service down. Why are these commercial what were commercial services doing not so well so that the the operator is coming to the council and to say that they need a subsidy uh there's been a, i mean it's fair to say service 22 has been supported by the council for many years in its current version of service 22 and previously as 24. uh so the other some of the other services have some pre-covid in terms of in 2019 certain elements so certain such as Service 12, where the council picked up. And then following the pandemic in 2020, uh, that had a particular big impact uh, on some of these at least less frequent services. So Service 25, which was introduced to cover bits of various other services, which the 15, 16 and 6, uh, were all bits that were commerged into one service to meet that. And although ridership is increasing, the way we travel, shop, work and everything does have some impact and these services that the numbers haven't returned unfortunately and and if numbers go up will will we need to potentially spend less money or are we committed to to this for till 2026 at this level uh the council we we have, there's a three-month clause on all of these contracts that we could terminate if required or we could make revisions as required. So we will get regular data in terms of revenue, passenger ridership, so we can see how it goes. Okay. Because about, we, we extended the existing contracts for a, a num, uh, period of time to allow us to get a, more, a clearer position of the more stable, what the position of the stable network is likely to be. Okay. Okay, thanks. But, but, but we need to be clear that people who are using these bus routes if the council didn't step in now these bus routes would go that's correct that they, they would go and they're providing the central links to employment education training yeah. so. okay so i think this is really important um because it's important that we do have an offer of a a, a good bus service across the city um but this is going to cost us the city council a significant amount of money but he it seems to me that's the right thing to do in terms of making sure that um, these bus services remain so that people do have an option that isn't a private car. Okay, Simon, Graham. Oh, no, Daz. Darren, good morning. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, 
I, I also want to touch on some of the comments you've made and Graham made earlier on in, in the meeting. But I, although it's me, I think I can safely speak for um, two of the Milton councillors and my two fellow Baffins, North Milton, South Coppener and Uncle Tom Cobbley, councillors as well. And we all think that the services, particularly 13 and 14 services, are lifelines for our areas, areas that are, would otherwise have to rely totally on the private car. Uh, in my case, Moorings Way and Tangier Road, and in your case, um, Gerald Locksway Road in particular, uh, would have to rely on the private car. Simon rightly talked earlier on about alternatives to the car, and if we didn't have that, then there wouldn't be any other than the pleasure of aqua cars. Um, I think one of the issues that really is affected in all areas, because this touches on basically all wards, um, is around the profit motive and the, the way that the privatised bus services and deregulated bus services work. Um, Graham rightly touched earlier on on issues about trying to sustain numbers. I'm often the only fully fair-paying passenger on the 13 or 14 bus. It's either people who go to Portsmouth College or pensioners. Uh, and I think what we've faced, as you well know, Gerald, uh, in local government is an issue whereby governments of all colours um, have put in place schemes and then not fully funded it, whether it was Labour and the, the bus passes, which stopped after one year, or whether it's the uh, existing really excellent scheme of curbing and capping bus fares that our Conservative colleagues have introduced, uh, which is something I know you and I have argued way before it was a gleam in the uh, government's eye. Um, and I think that re we have to really keep an eye on that, and I hope the government will continue uh, with its approach to the cap, because I think that's actually increasing numbers and actually reducing the problems um, that we face. Um, I think when, um, just as a bit of background, uh, Graham and Simon may know, uh, when first came to us in November saying, look, we can't do the routes, um, there was all scratching of heads as to try and what to do. Uh, we know about the limits of the BSIP money, um, particularly the original ways which roads had, uh, routes had to be altered in order to do that. I know that Portsmouth College came to one of our more, Baffin's morning surgeries and said, please help. Um, because it affected them too. Um, what I'm interested in are two things, Officer Colleagues and Gerald. Uh, um, many of my local residents want a more reliable service. Um, I've had to wait 15 minutes for a bus on Tangier Road. Uh, residents have come to me recently saying that either the bus didn't stop um, or they had to wait an hour, uh, which if it's um, an hour each way is not a pleasant experience. Um, Stagecoach, I believe, is, is a more reliable provider than, than first, in my experience, and I'm hoping that we can get a more reliable service. I also know that in previous iterations of this report, we've talked about enhancements to the, to the various bus services across the city. Uh, I realise we're in a situation whereby, yet again, first has decided no rather than change things and do things, um, but I'm hoping that we can get some enhancements, and I know that uh, certainly people in my area have got plenty of ideas um, to try and help officers. I do want to touch on another service, though, Gerald, which comes back to something you said earlier on, which is the service number 12, uh, which is what's left of the connection between Tipner, North End, Copner, and Milton. Um, and I know that there are developers at the moment, and the traffic team are in talking to developers, particularly at Tipner East, about ways in which we can enhance that service. Uh, I hope we're able to do that, uh, and I hope also we can take this opportunity in future to, re to ask the operators to look seriously at all the routes across the city so that they actually work for local people as opposed to working for the profit motive. But I support this, these proposals, Gerald, uh, and I'm sure many of my residents are delighted that yet again we've saved the buses. Okay, thanks, Darren. My apologies for having forgotten you. I'm sure. Simon. I'm afraid I'm going to be a pain, Gerald. I want to talk about some of the figures in the orange appendix. Okay, in which case um, we will have to... Get... Can we come to Graham if he's got something that's not in the orange appendix first? So that we don't... Because we'll have to shut the live stream off, won't we? If we're going to do that. If we're going to... Look at the appendix. Graham, have you got anything that's not appendicy? Appendix well, only in the sense that, I mean, I obviously recognise where we are and when commercial companies say they can't make routes work. But we have an absurd situation where 
these decisions are made on individual routes rather than the bus yeah. services all over the city. And so bus companies get away with basically saying, well, this one doesn't make money, but they're probably making loads of money on others, and they're yeah. not then required to use some of that surplus to actually fund other services, of course, which is what used to happen. But of course, we have to remember that that was deliberately done when the legislation was set up to basically put um, municipal corporation bus companies out of business because that's how they used to operate. The only way you could break open the market was to basically bust them, which is what they did. Uh, and now we're left with this rather absurd situation. I mean, I'm hoping that uh, uh, we can make some suggestions for improvements to service because I hear what Darren says about the 13, 14. I mean, I, for example, uh, don't use it as much as I might do because I have to get to lectures and seminars sometimes early in the morning and I can't, if I can't guarantee to be able to get on the bus, you know, I can't take the risk of walking in 20 minutes late for my seminar or lecture. So, you know, we do need a good reliable service and I'm hoping that maybe um, with the other work that's going on with buses, with the increase in services, uh, uh, you know, into evenings and Christmas and so on, it will actually create more demand, which might mean that we're in a better position. Whether these routes will actually make profits, of course, is another matter, but it might actually help to improve that. So, um, I, I, I mean, I, I think we have to support this. I don't have a problem supporting it, but um, I'll leave that there, and we can go on to the appendix, because I know Simon wants to ask some questions, and depending on what he asks, I might have some supplementaries, depending on what. Okay. Yeah, no, but, but Graham, I completely agree with you. It is, uh, in local government, we seem to have an agreement across all parties that the current system of how running to run buses is, doesn't work and that we need an integrated system. The way in which it, in, it, the law has been written to allow that means I don't think anybody has taken up that option because it's just really difficult to do. Um, but unfortunately, up at Westminster, while there's a universal view across local government that the current system is nuts, in Westminster, there appears to be a cross-party view to keep the current system, and that's been the view for the last 20 years across governments of all different colours, um, which is disappointing, but uh, maybe does reflect the fact that members of parliament and, and, um, and ministers are not always completely in touch with how things operate on the local level, um, and maybe as councillors we see a bit more of that. But anyway, um, so we now need to move into closed session and turn off the video stream. We will be back when we can be. <laughs>